quite an introduction. I'm not sure I can live up to that, to be honest. Um, thanks very much for having me. And it's, um, it's nice to be able to, to thank you as well, because, um, look, that was a really kind words from Tracy. But the fact is, it requires hospices to open their doors to us. Um, we're not newspapers. We're not radio. We have to tell the story of the struggles that you guys went through during the pandemic and struggle doesn't even come close, does it really, um, without being able to connect with the audience. Um, and we can only make that connection, as good as Trace's interviews are, and they are great, um, the connection really is with the people you deal with every day, and the, that's the patients. If we can't speak to patients, if we can't get access to hospices, then we can't tell those stories, we can't have that impact, and we can't make the government look again at issues that sometimes slip through the cracks. So thank you to every hospice that's ever opened its doors to us and let us um, speak to you. Um, I won't speak for too long and I'm kind of more interested in hearing what you have to ask, ask me really, but um, I, up until a few years ago, was pretty ignorant to what you guys did and do. And I think I'm pretty representative of a lot of the public. Um, and I'll come on in a second to why I think that needs to be addressed. but. Um, it was a personal experience for me that led me to understand more about what you guys do. My mum had breast cancer for five years um, and in the last few weeks of her life um, she was not in a good place and was struggling with pain and our local hospice intervened um, and through them we got specialist care for her at home which meant she could stay at home and die at home with my dad and me and my sister um, not in pain and I can never ever ever repay the gratitude my family have to the hospice um, St Giles that did that and um, from that moment really it was a kind of as I was a pretty young journalist then in the in Manchester Granada reports um, and it made me think about okay didn't know hospices did that I, I honestly let's be frank thought you looked after dying old people that's the extent of my knowledge and I didn't really realize how much you do and then looking into it, I didn't know how much you do with so little and so much of it coming from marathons and cake sales and your charity shops. And anyone that doesn't know how much money you guys have to raise, whenever I tell them, without an exception, they are shocked that you have to raise millions of pounds a year, every year, just to keep going and to provide people with dignity. And that's what it is, it's dignity and death. It's something my mum had that she wouldn't have had if you guys didn't exist. But you only exist often through the gratitude of people. And I know how hard it is every year, because I've spoken to many of your marketing teams every year trying to raise that money, is a momentous task. And I genuinely don't know how some of you do it. And I know in some cases, some hospices really struggle to do it. And that's why you can get into trouble. I just wouldn't underestimate, if I did, I'll waffle on a lot as I do, it's my job, but if one central message I will take, if you can take away from whatever I say today, just do not underestimate how little people know about what you do and how it's paid for. You cannot bang that drum enough because people are ignorant. They do not know the amazing world-class care you provide. When people do know, it knocks their socks off and it makes an enormous difference. But frankly, it shouldn't take a personal tragedy, and often you are dealing with them every day, for people to come to that knowledge. And so I think that's where we can step in and help. Now, I know inviting a camera and often a reporter and sometimes a producer into a hospice is difficult. I also know, and something I need to do more of in my job, the vast majority of your care is not performed in hospices. And so that's also a challenge for us to break away from that stereotype that it's always in a hospice when the fact 90% of your care is not in hospices at home. But in terms of getting the message out there of what you do and the amazing work you do, I think the media can play a really, really important part. I know your marketing teams slave away day after day to raise the money, but a single day letting a camera crew in for half a day, a bit of work, and it will be 45, sorry if we spent half a day and then it's 45 seconds on the news. And you're thinking, they were here all day for that. <laughs> 45 seconds. And I'm sure some of you are like, yeah, he came all day 
and then you put 45 seconds on the news. And I also apologise for people that we interview and then don't put on. I've had that a few times as well, and I apologise. Um, the cutting room floor is full of people that would have been famous. I'm, I apologise for that. But the fact is, that 40 seconds and that half a day is being seen in ITV News, national news terms, to three or four million people. Now, I know there's a sort of rule about how you raise money in your local area, but I know you all try and raise it where you can. I also know that, back to the central message, getting the message out there of what you guys do, I don't think you're going to get any more of a chance to do that than speaking to the media. Now, I know that requires trust, and I know sometimes some of you may, and I apologise if any of my colleagues, definitely not at ITV News, but in the media have sometimes maybe not slipped their word or let you in, it hasn't gone particularly well. I hope that hasn't been the case, but if it has been the case, most journalists want, who, who come to you, and we're talking here about end-of-life care, they're doing it because they, they care, they want to get the story out, they understand, and let them in. Definitely always let ITV in, <laughs> then the BBC, if you have to. <laughs> but the fact is, letting the media in and getting those stories on TV make, I think, an enormous difference. Yes, I have no doubt that our reports put pressure on Matt Hancock and Helen Waitley and others, and it meant, and often with any government, not just this one, they act when things look bad, or they act when, at the last second, something has to be done. But often, it's a bigger thing going on, and actually, it's the public awareness that you need to raise. The pressure has to come from the public, it has to come from them. And ultimately, you do that, I think, by opening the doors up um, to the media. And right now, I'm working on a separate investigation into social housing, and we've done that now for seven or eight months. And we're starting to see, we think, real change in that as well. So it's not just for hospices, but I think for you guys, the central message is, getting people to understand what you do. And I really think we can be a force for change in that respect. Um, so for every hospice that's ever let us in, I really appreciate it. If we call you and, want to, and to, to ask to, to be let in, please let us in. Um, and the one thing I will say on a practical point, I know sometimes it's difficult because you've got, it's, a diff, it's, diff, look, it's difficult. The requests we make are difficult. We, are, we want to film with people ultimately they're not very well and are in some cases dying. And I know that can be very, very difficult. But on the whole, honesty and patience is what's required on both ends. And so the requests we make are always hopefully from a good place and we understand if things change, sometimes you turn up and it's not exactly what's promised. But if you can make that effort, that bit of extra effort to give us what we're asking for and we put it on the news, I can assure you the positive on the whole will be out, and the outcome will be positive, and I think the message will be um, spread across the country. I'll stop talking now, because I think that's about it. So, thank you very much for listening.